propelled by rows of cilia all over its body. Here too, cilia waft particles into the gullet of a microscopic vorticella. Traveling in nanospace lets us better understand the forces driving tiny lives. Mites of the Acorus genus are not much bigger than those microscopic water creatures. They tend to live and breed under straw mats and carpets. Fortunately, wherever there are small mites, larger mites devour them. Nature always keeps her balance. That world, measured in tenths of a millimeter, will serve as our gateway, our introduction to nanospace. Imagine what a barrier people crossed when they first looked through a microscope at the savage beauty of these tiny worlds. We asked, where did the quest for nanospace begin? London, the Royal Society. Around 1620, Francis Bacon, who has been called the first scientific thinker, began discussing natural philosophy with like-minded friends. This was the start of the Royal Society. Its research tradition has been upheld by such scientists as Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking. Among the society's treasures, this copy of Micrographia, written in English, not scientific Latin, by Robert Hooke in 1665. His work with the microscope brought him lasting fame. Micrographia contains some of the most beautiful studies of microscopic observations ever made. Insects are precise to the finest detail. Drawings like these stimulated other scholars of Hooke's time. He even improved the microscope. This is a replica of Hooke's instrument. He created this device to focus light onto his specimens. It compensated for the poor quality of lenses which could only magnify about 50 times. Not just his pen, but his mind was precise. In addition to studying insects, microscopic fossils led him to consider evolution centuries before Charles Darwin. Hooke is best known for showing that living things are made of cells. In fact, that word is his legacy to biology. The structure of cork reminded him of tiny rooms, the cells of cloistered monks. Hooke's word endures, his contribution with it. His discovery that living things are made of cells remains one of the key developments in all biology. In a moment from a world of large cells, to one in which life's beauty hides from us, disguised by tiny size. A great smooth wall of silica looms up, perforated by rows of curious symmetrical designs. It's the shell of a microscopic plant found by the billions in seas and fresh water, a diatom. Diatoms have distinctive shapes. This species is Cymbella. We saw minnow-sized fish eating water fleas. What do water fleas eat? Diatoms, like Gumphonema. Look at this, nature's perfection sculpted in silica, 
just thousands of a millimeter long. Seeing nature's wisdom at this level, we begin to understand why computer chips are made of silica too. But that's another story. This realm is one in which strange dome-shaped objects rise and fall like tides beneath a giant moon. Perhaps they're living things growing and wasting on a flat, barren landscape of fantastical design. And let's not get carried away. When human breath fogs up cold glass with water droplets, that's what we're looking at right now in nanospace. At this level, substances change back and forth between liquid and gas. If you breathe on cold glass, it fogs. Step back, and the water evaporates. Breathe on the glass again, and so on. Like a jewel, nanospace has many facets. Many of its worlds we'll never see. Let's take a journey of a different sort, in time, to find out who unlocked the doors of nanospace. Nineteen thirty six was the year of the Berlin Olympics. Television was in its experimental infancy. Using a beam of electrons to generate pictures gave electrical engineer Ernst Ruska an idea. Why not harness electrons to study invisible worlds? Ruska and his colleagues reasoned that replacing light with a beam of electrons would improve the power of microscopes. The project took 10 years. They produced the first useful electron microscope in 1939. What happens inside goes something like this. Just as light is focused by a lens of glass, an electron beam passing through a specimen is bent by electromagnetic lenses. A magnified image results. Resolving power was better than the best of optical instruments. These bacteria, Escherichia coli, are seen with an electron microscope. The same sample on the right was photographed with an optical microscope. Ruska had smaller targets in mind, viruses. These mysterious disease agents were invisible to light microscopes. It would be 1940 before Ruska finally photographed a virus. Just as E. coli bacteria live by the millions in the human gut, these tadpole-like T2 phages are viruses infecting E. coli. The electron microscope proved beyond all doubt that agents of disease were hard at work, even in invisible worlds. Worlds, within worlds, within worlds. Electron microscopes plunge us into nanospace. How far can we go? However small the world we're looking at, there's always something smaller still. We ask, we seek, we discover, and we seek smaller treasures all over again.
the variety of available electron microscopes gets larger year by year. This one can study changes in the specimen being observed.